I'm Stephanie here with the GA Huddle, and I'm also here with Joel Simpkins today, who is the Managing Director of Houlihan Loki's Technology Group and the head of their gaming sector. We're here to talk to him about a recent report that was produced by Houlihan Loki. And the first question we have is, what kind of research does the firm do each year on the gaming sector? Well, I, and I've been in the gaming industry for roughly 25 years as an investment banker, as well as an equity uh, research analyst. So I'd say a lot of my research is day-to-day, hand-to-hand combat, you know, talking to CEOs, CFOs, boards of directors in the industry, obviously following all the different trade rags and information. Really, also, I think, you know, someone that's going to cover this sector has to be intimately aware and involved in the product. And I, I will confess, uh, I live in New Jersey, and I've got about probably 30 sports betting and online gaming apps on my phone. So I think you have to understand the product to really uh, cover the industry and have your finger on the pulse. You'll be well placed to answer our next questions then if you're a sports betting fan. Um, we were going to talk about how we've seen some sports betting M&A this year, most notably the fact that Fanatics uh, acquired points bet. And recently, as part of NFL Week 1, it was the third place most downloaded sports betting app. Was that a surprise to you? Did you expect that? Yeah, not not a huge surprise. I mean, listen, there's a lot of momentum overall in the industry. I think right now, as, as it speaks, we're in Week 5, probably by the time this records, Week 7 of the NFL. But you know, all the channel checks and data we've been doing have been really positive in terms of momentum for the broader industry. So it doesn't surprise me that a lot of these new and emerging apps are getting a lot of traction, particularly given some of the marketing and, and buzz that's out there in that big push in the lead up to the season. Great. And what kind of other M&A do you expect to see either later this year or next year, either in sports betting or the gaming sector as a whole? Yeah, I would say, you know, by the velocity of the phone calls that I'm getting over the last couple of months, as some of these deals have been announced, you know, I think everybody is really looking at their business and looking at different opportunities, you know, those that maybe are capital constrained, um, and are possibly looking for an exit or alternatives for their business, those that are looking to kind of plug in and fill different holes in their portfolio or sort of their capabilities amongst their broader tech stack and that have access to capital and liquidity are looking at some of the uh, I'd say sifting through some of the wreckage that we've seen in that 2020, 2021 fallout of mm. a lot of capital chasing the space, folks potentially burning through capital and again, being in sort of a, a more difficult position of what can they acquire attractively. So uh, we think there's going to be a lot of uh, additional M&A in space and things are certainly heating up, but it's certainly going to be a little bit more episodic and really dependent upon different companies' needs and where they sit in the ecosystem within gaming. But uh, overall, activity is certainly uh, you know, ex accelerating at this point. Definitely. As far as uh, new players and different companies in the industry as well, we've seen ESPN Bet uh, come onto the scene too. How do you think they're going to do, especially with the big network media power they have? Yeah, listen, ESPN is a very uh, powerful brand. It's obviously been around a long time. It has a huge following. I would say it certainly skews a little bit to a more older demographic, right? We all follow the news around cord cutting and, and the structural changes that are happening to cable and broader media. So I'd say on one hand, I, I think we're interested to see how things shake out, just given their brand, given their reach, given the, the consumer footprint and sort of how they potentially you know, tie in with Penn National um, or Penn Entertainment um, going forward. Um, I would say we are still somewhat skeptical, right? It is a very competitive industry. You've obviously seen draft, the big, you know, three DraftKings, BetMGM, FanDuel um, gain a lot of market share to date. So sort of coming in as sort of the, the new entrant, despite their scale and reach, you're going to have to put a lot of marketing and customer acquisition behind developing that brand. People aren't necessarily going to show up or switch or add a third, fourth, fifth, or a sports fifth sports book. I'm probably an outlier with 20, 30 sports. That's my day job, but most people are really, uh, you know, going to play three or four apps and getting in that, them to sort of select that next one. And what's in it for me as a consumer, you know, easier said than done. But, you know, again, um, you, you look at this industry, right? We're only call it five years post PASPA. We're still a very young industry here, at least in the U.S. from a regulated perspective. So it is still, you know, if I was going to put it in baseball terms, you know, a second or third inning uh, of this industry. Sure. I was going to say, I wonder if it'll be app number 31 on your phone. Um, <laughs> one of the apps that's probably definitely there, uh, DraftKings, is working on its race to profitability. And we did see some improvement in Q2. Uh, what do you think about how they're going to do in future? 
Yeah, listen, I, I spent you know the first two thirds of my career as an equity research analyst. So I used to be a talking head going on things like CNBC and Bloomberg talking about stocks and uh, talking to institutional investors, whether it's your Wellingtons, Fidelities, T. Rose. And, and hedge funds. And I think, listen, they got the message that, you know, burning, you know, a, a ton of cash without any hope of turning a profit was not going to was not going to be the right message to the investment community. So I think their, you know, turn in their performance really reflects, you know, momentum around some of their products like same game parlays reflects more of a dis- discipline around customer acquisition and and also probably more of a focus on retention. You know, they certainly are benefiting from the fact that they are operating in a number of states. They've got iGaming as well as a number of states. And they listen to their credit. You know, they have built a, a national brand. Uh, you know, one personal analogy, I just came back from a trip to Boston to visit um, some clients up there. And I happened to be at the Red Sox game. And, you know, given that I had their app on my phone, I was able to instant in, instantly open up the app. Place a wait, place a couple of wagers. Unfortunately, two of them were wrong. I had the under, and I had the Red Sox winning. But you know, the ability to go seamlessly from state to state and not really have to worry from a consumer perspective whether I can place a bet and just open up the app and play um, certainly gives them a lot of ease. Either some of their competitors are maybe not operating in other states or in every state, or don't um, you know have the brand reach right. So they really are you know a top of mind brand and. And we'll see what happens over the next couple of quarters or years in terms of that pivot towards profitability and whether that's sustainable or not. I'm sorry about your Red Sox loss. <laughs> <laughs> it's, okay. it's okay. I'm a Phillies fan, fan but I figure hey, I'm at the game. I might as well. Uh, uh, when in Boston. <laughs> exactly. I'm wrong. Um, the Houlihan Loki report actually mentions that tribal operators could potentially supplant traditional commercial gaming. And I wondered what advantages you think the Native American tribes have there, too. Well, you know, first and foremost, you know, they are uh, most of them have significant access to capital, right? You look at some of the tribes that are operating, whether in California, Texas, Florida, um, you know, these are very powerful organizations that are incredibly sophisticated, have come up the learning curve over the last 20, 30 years, have very seasoned and experienced management teams, right? So we were talking earlier about access to capital and kind of the haves and the have nots, right? These are essentially think of them as sovereign nations and you know, think of them as, uh, you know, Middle Eastern oil, you know, deep pockets with lots of resources, uh, as well as patience and really a long term view. I-, I would say some groups are more progressive than others. Some are more worried about, I'd say, protecting their turf and and not having, you know, digital um, competition. Right. So we saw a very cloudy and mixed message in California last year around the initiative to legalize sports betting. Um, with that said, there are tribes that we talk to on a daily basis that are very progressive, that are already operating in the digital gaming space. Like you have a group like the Mohegan tribe in Connecticut, that's one of the leading operators in the space and has a very experienced team um, running their digital business. Right. So groups like that are looking for M&A, uh, are looking for uh, you know ways to enhance their technology offerings. So I think it's it's there's certainly an unknown in, at this point, some of these groups in terms of what their play is longer term. But I think you know, gradually over the next couple of years, um, they are going to be some of the most active acquirers in the space. Um, they are very active in the land-based traditional gaming side, whether it's Seminole or P- Porch Creek and others. Um, and I would expect really no different uh, as kind of the industry evolves over the next couple of years. Okay. Our uh, final question for you today is sure. possibly a, a fun one or a challenging one as someone who's a, a sports better yourself. Uh if you were to invest in a sports betting operator stock, who would you buy from and why? Uh, you know, I would prefer to stay away from some of the uh, individual stock calls at this point. I, I do think, you know, there are some interesting uh, plays out there. I think if I was an investor in the space right now, some of the B2B providers out there that really, I'd say, ultimately benefit from the rising tide, right? It's hard to, you know, sit here and say, okay, DraftKings is going to be the winner. FanDuel is going to be the winner. Points bet, Rush Street, some of the kind of you know individual publicly traded operators, right? Obviously, you know, points bet ultimately monetized, um, you know, to fanatics. I do think you know there's some interesting plays out there, whether it's the geniuses or the radars, right? Who will benefit from the rising tide, right? Whether it's whether it's OSB works, DFS, sweepstakes, all the other gaming products out there, make it or not. Um, this industry will only continue to grow, and those that have access to the data and the rights. Um, that is highly valuable. They obviously have to figure out ways to continue to monetize their products and services. 
But I think, you know, B2B probably ultimately is a longer term and maybe less volatile winner. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. And yeah. uh, we will all look forward to Hulahan Luki's next report. All right. It was a pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh,